Org. And welcome to For the Health of It. And joining me in the kitchen, of course, is Dr. Louise Pineda. Welcome, Dr. Pineda. Thank you, dear. Love to be here with you. Well, we always have a good time, and we try to give out some good information to everybody out there that's watching us that certainly is, has a need regarding cancer. And um, on the show today, we've got Dr. April Maddox that's going to talk with us about breast cancer, right? That is correct. And you're going to cook. What are you going to cook up for us today? I am going to make a preparation of goat cheese with milk and pepper, which is delightful for people who are going through chemotherapy. Through chemotherapy. Very nutritious, very flavored to the mouth. Well, and that's one of the things that you do, especially you've got a new cookbook that's going to be coming out, but it's about learning about how, about taste and smell. And so would you share with our viewers uh, an educational tip that might help them? Thank you very much, my dear. And I know that you will say you are a nagging guy because you always <laughs> repeat yourself so much. But I'm going to make a point to you and everybody out there today. Follow this with me. Okay. If I have in my pocket and I have my wallet okay. and I have one dollar in it and I go and I buy something important to me but it costs one dollar. Okay. Now, when you think about it, I cannot buy anything else anymore until I get some more money in my pocket. Does That's that make true. any sense? Lots All of right. sense. Well, okay. The point that I'm trying to make to you is that when you taste and you smell, you have so much money to taste and smell for it. When you lose it, you cannot do it again unless you get some mo money into it. The taste buds, the smell buds, when you go through the treatments of cancer, are almost like losing that money out of your pocket. You cannot taste it again you need to recharge it again in order to feel all over again and enjoy your food and get a good nutrition. That's wonderful. Well, listen, you all won't want to miss what's coming up next. We're going to share this recipe with you, something that's going to help you or someone you know that needs this. We'll be right back. Dr. Elise Pineda has dedicated the past 25 plus years to serving needs of the community as a hematologist and oncologist. His office is conveniently located off Highway 31 in Vestavia at 1909 Laurel Road. Also at the 1909 Laurel Road is the headquarters for Cooking with Cancer, Inc. Helping those afflicted with cancer enjoy a better quality of life through good food. For more information on Dr. Pineda and his medical clinic, visit us at www.drpineda.com or to set an appointment today, call 205-978-978. 3570. To learn how you can raise awareness, go to www.cookingwithcancer.org. Luis F. Pineda, MDPC, making a difference in cancer care. No matter what life's challenges might be, they can be overcome through faith, family, and friends. Read One Woman's Story of Triumph in The Last Christmas Ride by Edie Hand and Jeffrey Addison. Available at Amazon.com and wherever books are sold. Hi, I'm Edie Hand, and joining me is Dr. Louise Pineda, and we're going to be cooking for cancer right here in this kitchen. So what are we cooking up, Dr. Pineda? Yes, my dear. If I can cook, a rat can cook. Anyhow. Do you think I'm a big rat or something? <laughs> but let me tell you something, though. I, I want you to see how simple this is. Because one of the things that we want to make sure is that we do simple things. I'm all about we it. We have very simple gelatin okay. that is unflavored. I'll be your Vanna White. Now, I'm going to make a point to you, okay. and that is this is monosodium glutamate. Easy for you to say. Yes, ma'am. Better known as an MSG. Well, you know, MSG gives me a headache, so I usually can't. I know, that's one of the potential side effects of that. However, contains only about 20% of the sodium that salt contains and tastes just like salt. And better yet, flavors your food and it stimulates your ability to taste it. I thought you said it was going to help my brain. I was going to sure try to change my situation. <laughs> Heavy cream. And then we have roasted pepper, which... This is the original one, and wow. we are just basically roasted it, and then okay. we have it already roasted in here. 
And then we have goat cheese. Mm, the goat cheese. And finally, we have some basil. Now, the point of this will be simple to make, inexpensive, very tasty, very stimulating, and it will be something that will provide great deal of nutrition because it has a lot of fat into it, and it has a lot of carbohydrates into it, and more than anything else, good flavor to it. Is that any, any specific symptom that someone that has is, is going through cancer or radiation with? Absolutely. We are talking basically today about breast cancer. And the point that I'm trying to make to you then is that most people, one way or another, will have to go through either radiation or chemotherapy. And one of the main side effects is the development of a symptom called mucositis, meaning an inflammation of the infant lining of the mouth and the numbness of the ability to have the sense of a smell. This particular recipe is then oriented to you. And by the way, if you have any ideas that we can use to help some of the people on this, please go ahead and email to us, write to us, cookingwithcancer.org. Right, and cookingwithcancer.org if they want to learn about our different products or what's going on with Cooking with Cancer, Inc. So let's get into this Absolutely. recipe. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead. Got to put a little heat on it. There you like you it go, hot ma'am. in the kitchen? All right. <laughs> and I will go ahead and ask you to please okay. put the... Um, is this the first thing I put in? You may. The heavy cream. And heavy how much cream. is this like? That's approximately couple. one and a half cup. One and a half cup. Okay. Okay. And then as it goes on and heat up, okay. then you're going to add the goat cheese. Goat and cheese. And it's approximately three ounces of that. And you may want to just stir it and kind of mix it on okay. and beat on it. And I like to beat on that. Like hey, that, that could get all my frustrations out. Yes, you bet you, my dear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, we'll just go ahead and do that. Okay. And then basically we are just heating it up. Okay. All right. All right, and as we're heating it up, we continue, what will we add next, Dr. Pineda? Just for television, we're, we're gonna give them a little smell-o-vision, so, right. because it doesn't always cook on our time. What right. do we add next? The next interesting point, and I always talk about pepper, and I always say how important peppers really are, because peppers are good, not because they get you hot, but actually because they wake those receptors up. I tell right. you what, I've tried some of your peppers. It does wake it up. Yes, ma'am. And that now, brain this in goes particular is called the Mayan loving pepper. What about that? I'm talking about Latin American guys. Oh, my God. In any case, the point that I'm trying to make to you is that these actually stimulate the back receptors in the mouth. Okay, back so there. So, that is correct. Okay. So, if you have any troubles with the front because of the chemotherapy, you will taste with the back side of it. Okay. So, we will go Pop ahead and in. add this thing. Okay. All right, and just mix it very nicely and well, okay? Okay, and what we do next? All right, next, my dear, we are going to go and do the monosodium glutamate. Now, monosodium glutamate should be considered just like what happens with salt. In okay. other words, we are going to be tasting, and then we are going to be trying it, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Trying it, okay. So I'm gonna go Put ahead that and in. initially add just a little pinch of it, and you just keep on stirring with a lot of energy to it so they get to it. And if I do it too much, I'm like, okay, I'm All on. right, there you go. No, my dear, you're doing just great. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you're a good coach. <laughs> All right. Now, All right, now what's next? Now, in here I have unflavored gelatin. And the point that I will make to you, however, is the gelatin, in order to dissolve this particular form of gelatin, it has to be in a warm liquid. So this okay. is supposed to be warm and you can see that it's already yeah, the melting very nicely. Mm -hmm. in it, okay? okay. So you keep on stirring and I will go ahead and drop it a little bit at a time. Okay. And yeah, I see the, our texture starting to take right. form here. Okay. Okay. So otherwise if you do it too fast it's gonna become lumpy on you, right? So you want yeah, to Yeah I know a few lumpy folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to lean out my lumps. <laughs> yes, my dear. Okay. Right. This is going to give, if you would, the body of this because eventually this will form something that in culinary terms is called a terrine. 
Okay. And that's a rhyming, Means. some beautiful structure okay. that will have a shape to it. All right. All right. So you have it ready? Got huh? it ready. Okay, okay. Well, good. So the next simple thing to do, I have a plastic container in here, right? I mean, okay. it's as simple as that. And I have then, I will put it right here. Okay. And I will put a little bit of leaves of basil into it. Okay. And the basil is going to give me a lot of flavor to it. Now and you then just base that across the bottom, and then what do we do next? And then the next step will be just Cut pour some of okay. this on. Okay. Right. Okay. Very simple. And then I go by layers. Okay, I'm going to put this and over I here so we can get it. Okay. All right. Let's move this. Okay. All and right. I have one layer of pepper in here, mm -hmm. and then I put some more of the liquid on it. Okay. And then I have another layer of pepper in here. And I put another layer of the fluid on it. And then I garnish at the end of this, again, with a little bit of the basil. And that is ready to go in the refrigerator. And how long do you leave it in the fridge? Whatever one time you want to do, because it's going to do just like a gelatin will do. Oh, it'll just sit, it'll just mold ah, and take its little form. Isn't that okay. beautiful? Mm -hmm. And then I just happen that I have one of these things here, the way it was put into it, and then basically I pull it very nicely out of this, and that's the way it's going to be looking like. All right. And as I cut it, it's going to be this beautiful little thing in there. Okay. As you can see, it's very colorful, it very is. attractive. Looks and sick. then by the end, I just do my beautiful presentation of it. Right here. And here you go. Voila. That and, the is and, and the name of the recipe again? And that would be at the Rhine with goat cheese and roasted pepper. Ideal for individuals with cancer who have the symptoms of the oncocytes, providing inexpensive nutritional way of enjoying food. Thank you, Dr. Pinedo. And thank you. And stay with us. And we'll be right back with Dr. April Maddox to talk with us about breast cancer. Dr. Louise Pineda has dedicated the past 25 plus years to serving needs of the community as a hematologist and oncologist. His office is conveniently located off Highway 31 in Vestavia at 1909 Laurel Road. Also at the 1909 Laurel Road is the headquarters for Cooking with Cancer, Inc. Helping those afflicted with cancer enjoy a better quality of life through good food. For more information on Dr. Pineda and his medical clinic, visit us at www.drpineda.com or to set an appointment today, call 205-978-3570. To learn how you can raise awareness, go to www.cookingwithcancer.org. Luis F. Pineda, MDPC, making a difference in cancer care. No matter what life's challenges might be, they can be overcome through faith, family, and friends. Read One Woman's Story of Triumph in The Last Christmas Ride by Edie Hand and Jeffrey Addison. Available at Amazon.com and wherever books are sold. Hi, I'm Edie Hand, and welcome back to For the Health of It. And joining us in this segment is Dr. April Maddox. Thank you for joining us. And Dr. Louise Pineda, as usual, he's got some great tips for us on cooking with cancer always, Dr. Maddox. But we wanted to get started today to let people know that your specialty is in breast cancer. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm a actually a breast surgeon. Breast surgeon. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, is that, I, I know a lot of women that I am around, we all are always concerned about the heredity factor and we have a lot of cysts in our breasts. Yeah. Uh, should we be concerned or is how early should we be having those mammograms? Well, in general, I mean, most people, we don't start screening mammograms until the age of 40. We usually do get a baseline at the age of 35. Um, unless somebody has a strong family history or maybe like a first degree relative, like a mother or an older sister had breast cancer before the age of 40, then we would start screening them usually 10 years prior to when that person had their diagnosis. Say if the mom had breast cancer at 42, then you would want to start screening her daughter at like 32. That's usually the recommendation. 
Well, that's good to know because I, you know, when you a lot of women we sit and we talk about different things. I had a lumpectomy uh, several years ago, and I, I remember the fear yeah. uh, because so much cancer in my family's history. But I was very fortunate that it had not metastasized. So. Right. Um, had a good surgeon at that time, so that is important, like you said, early detection. Okay. Early detection is the key, no, no doubt about it. I mean, that's really um, how we really change lives, really. Um, and mammography, you know, sometimes people don't want to get them because they're not the most comfortable thing in the world. And, no, they're not. Um, <laughs> but they really do pick up cancer early, especially um, microcalcifications. That's where you pick them up early or maybe even just a density that is not palpable yet, but the mammogram picks it up. So it Can is very important. Can you explain that a little bit to our viewers that might not understand what sure, that means? Sure, <laughs> what that really means, right. But uh, sometimes, you know, a mammogram, uh, in some women like fibrocystic disease or women that have very dense breasts, sometimes the mammograms can be very difficult to read. And so a lot of people say, oh, you know, so my mother's cancer was never detected by mammogram, but there are a lot of cancers that actually are detected early by mammogram before it's ever palpable. And one of the things is, is that um, a lot of cancers will start within the duct. And majority of them actually start within the duct. And there is uh, microcalcifications, which are small little calcifications that can be picked up on a mammogram early. And there's not anything that you would feel, uh, but the mammogram it detects it. Even an ultrasound does not detect microcalcifications until they get macrocalcifications, until they're bigger. bigger. So it is one of those things where even though it's not the most comfortable, uh, early detection is the key, and there are certain things that a mammogram will detect early that maybe is not palpable yet. So those are some of the things, and when they pick those up, then they usually will recommend a biopsy. Dr. Matter, you're so kind to be here. Oh, well, thank we you. Really, I really appreciate, appreciate you asking you know, me to be oh, here. Absolutely not, yes. Uh, you know, the purposes of these programs is to educate you people so that cancer is not a surprise to anybody. Right. Now, we are talking about mammogram and the screening of it. But let me perhaps move a little forward into this and uh, what are the things that a female at home can do and what is that she may find mm -hmm. that may trigger the visit to somebody like you? Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's very important to do self-exams. It is. And we do recommend that women do a self-exam at least once a month. And we recommend to actually do them after they've had their menstrual cycle. Because before the menstrual cycle, a lot of people are very tender, the breasts are a little more swollen, it's not the easiest to do the exam, but after the menstrual cycle, that's the best time to do uh, an exam. And we do recommend that women do it monthly um, because there are many cancers that the women find on their own because they actually feel a lump in their breast. And maybe they had a normal mammogram six months prior and it wasn't there, but all of a sudden they feel it. So it is very important. I think it's being in tune to your own body mm -hmm. a lot of times, isn't it? Just sure. not being afraid to touch it and right. see what could be happening with you. I've learned that myself. Yeah. But perhaps a point to be made is that you don't really have to have pain in order to have cancer, isn't that right? That is correct. You know, most cancers don't really hurt until they get large enough or they're causing pressure of some sort, or, you know, maybe on a nerve or something, et cetera. So you actually saying that anybody who does self-examination and goes to the physician to be checked, mammogram, if they in self-examination they find that there are lumps or there are discharges, even mm -hmm. they are not painful, yeah. they should actually ask for it, shouldn't they, right? They should. Oh, definitely. I mean, if you feel a lump period and you never felt it before, then you should act on it. Um, you do need to see a physician about it, and it does need to be worked up, you know, in terms of getting a mammogram or getting an ultrasound. Um, if you have nipple discharge, you definitely need to talk to your physician about that. Um, there are certain discharges that we definitely are more concerned about in regards to cancer, such as a bloody discharge or a spontaneous discharge that is occurring uh, without any type of stimulation to the breast. So those are abnormal. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. April Maddox, for joining Dr. Panay and I today and sharing some insight. And if people want to get in touch with you, 
would they, where are you at this time? I'm located at Brookwood mm -hmm. Hospital. I'm in the, um, the professional office building. Uh, my office is called Breast Care Center of Birmingham. And I'm there uh, four and a half days a week. And I also go to St. Vincent's 119 um, on Monday afternoons. All right, so you got it. So stay with us. We're gonna have more from our dear friend Pickles if you'll stay with us. Dr. Lise Pineda has dedicated the past 25 plus years to serving needs of the community as a hematologist and oncologist. His office is conveniently located off Highway 31 in Vestavia at 1909 Laurel Road. Also at the 1909 Laurel Road is the headquarters for Cooking with Cancer, Inc. Helping those afflicted with cancer enjoy a better quality of life through good food. For more information on Dr. Pineda and his medical clinic, visit us at www.drpineda.com or to set an appointment today, call 205-978-978. 3570. To learn how you can raise awareness, go to www.cookingwithcancer.org. Luis F. Pineda, MDPC, making a difference in cancer care. No matter what life's challenges might be, they can be overcome through faith, family, and friends. Read One Woman's Story of Triumph and The Last Christmas Ride by Edie Hand and Jeffrey Addison. Available at Amazon.com and wherever books are sold. Welcome back to For the Health of It. Dr. Maddox is still with us. Thank you. And Gina, you got all those great questions from Pickles? I have got a whole list of great responses that we've had this week of people who have written in some questions. And uh, we're going to get the answers from Dr. Maddox and Edie Hand. All right. Sounds good to me. All right. What's one of our first questions that you got? One of our first questions that we have today is who should have genetic testing? Dr. Maddox? That's a good question. I get asked that all the time, actually. Um, as you know, there is a blood test that is actually um, called BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic testing that is actually done by a company called Myriad Genetics in Salt Lake City, Utah. And this is a company that all they do is specialize in genetic testing. But th there are certain genes that we do worry about in terms of risk for breast cancer. And those genes are called BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. And these genes do increase a woman's, uh, as well as even a man's, uh, risk of having breast cancer. Um, they can even cause ovarian cancer as well as they can cause in men early, um, earlier diagnosis or, of prostate cancer and some colon cancers as well. Um, and there are certain people that ought to be tested like a woman with premenopausal breast cancer and what I mean by that is a lady diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 50. That's a woman that um, we definitely recommend genetic testing on. Um, the other thing is if they have a very strong family history of breast cancer, such as uh, a first generation that had a breast cancer that was premenopausal, a second generation that had breast cancer that was premenopausal, or maybe even somebody that has a family history of breast and ovarian cancer in basically being seen in almost every generation, a cancer history. So those type of people are people that we definitely ought to recommend genetic testing on. The other people are people that have been diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer or maybe a first degree relative that had bilateral breast cancer. Um, those definitely are people that ought to have genetic testing. If there's a, a relative with a male breast cancer, that's another person that ought to have genetic testing or if they're a close relative of that person. Well, what, uh, what percentage of men have breast cancer? One percent. One percent. Yeah, and most of those will actually be a gene carrier. Most of them will actually be a BRCA2 gene carrier. You know, I, I know that with genetics and that, but what age could you really have that type of test? Right. Usually, we do not recommend that type of testing until somebody's at least older than 18, really in their 20s, because mm -hmm. And even 20 year olds, it's very hard for them to undergo that type of testing and the understanding of it. They've got to be able to truly understand what a genetic test may mean and the implications of that testing. And that is, 
say if somebody got tested and they were positive for the gene and they carried a gene, does that mean that they need to undergo surgery and all of that? No, those are people that you're going to watch a whole lot closer, a whole lot sooner, but you're going to be under kind of the radar, so to speak, much sooner to detect. Now, there are some of those people that we do recommend surgery um, because their risks are so high to develop cancer the longer they live. Does that mean they're going to get it? No, it doesn't. It just means that their risk is much higher than the average person out there. And so there are certain situations, such as in BRCA1 and BRCA2, where we do recommend surgery. But what we like to do is recommend surgery once, say like a female, is done having her children, um, maybe like in her late 30s or mid to late 30s, and then have surgery. Because you don't want to take away, <clears throat> I guess, the uh, joys of life, you know, right. kids. But um, we definitely have to be realistic because it's hard for people sometimes if they get diagnosed with something like that and they become very scared because they understand that maybe their mother had breast cancer in, at 41 and they don't want to have that happen to them. And you can understand those fears. Exactly. And so you, what do you do to kind of soothe those fears? Well, you know, the other thing is we really try to reassure them is that we're going to watch them like a hawk. Um, we're going to do everything we can to prevent it. Even if we don't undergo surgery, we're going to put them on an agent to help prevent breast cancer developing, such as tamoxifen or Avista or those type of medications. What, those are people that you will get a breast MRI on because they're at a much higher risk to get breast cancer and oftentimes get breast cancer younger and the mammogram is often very difficult to read in a younger lady because the breast tissue is so dense that it makes it difficult for the radiologist to read it. So breast MRI really is indicated in somebody who carries a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 gene. And I'm glad you brought that up because that was actually a question that and we had was it, who needs a breast MRI. And we've got time for just one more. This well, one. breast MRI is a new modality that is out there. And it is really more indicated in high-risk women, such as somebody with a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 gene or a very strong family history. It is indicated in somebody who has been diagnosed with breast cancer, just newly diagnosed, and say that they want to look at the other side or make sure that there's nothing else going on. And Gina, if people want to get in touch with you or Pickles, how can they do that before we go? Sure. We would love to have your questions and respond to them here on the air. If you would, please write us at Pickles at cookingwithcancer.org. And what does Pickles always say? Well, Edie, you know Pickles <laughs> always says, life's what you taste of it. And thank you, Gina, and thank you, Dr. Maddox. Thank you. And thank you, and join us next time for the health of it. For the health of it is brought to you by Cooking with Cancer. For more information, log on to cookingwithcancer.org. No matter what life's challenges might be, they can be overcome through faith, family, and friends. Read One Woman's Story of Triumph in The Last Christmas Ride by Edie Hand and Jeffrey Addison. Available at Amazon.com and wherever books are sold.